good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining me for another book discussion in our Black Lives Matter series. Today, we are discussing Oreo by Fran Ross. Uh, before we get started, maybe we can just go around and introduce ourselves so people have a name to put to a voice. I am Lucy. I'm a library tech in the youth department at AADL. And um, in addition to a lot of youth programming, I love participating in these book programs. And hey, my name is Jacob. I am an employee in the outreach department and I feel very similarly to Lucy. My name is Marissa. I also work in the outreach department with Jacob. Um, and yeah, same. <laughs> I'm Emily. Uh, I'm a librarian at AADL. I select books for kids fiction, but do programming for adults. My name is Elizabeth, and um, I'm a little bit the opposite of Emily. I purchase um, the adult fiction and book on CD collection, but I do a lot of youth programming and story times and things like that. So I'm happy to be here for another of these discussions as always. Yeah, my name is Lauren and I work as a desk clerk at the library and I've participated in several of these discussions and I've loved them. So I'm excited to be here today too. Great. Um, so Oreo, before we get started, I'll just uh, give a little background on Fran Ross. This was the only novel written by Fran Ross. It was written in 1974. Um, Ross died at the age of 50 from cancer. She was born in Philadelphia in 1935, moved to New York in 1960, where she worked as a proofreader, a copy editor, a freelance writer, and contributed pieces to magazines. In addition to um, being a TV writer, she moved to Los Angeles and she wrote for Richard Pryor's show. And she was offered, but declined to write for Laverne and Shirley, which would have made that a little bit of a different show. Um, and then she moved back to New York. So that is the background on Fran Ross. Um, would anyone like to give a brief overview, if they can, of Oreo? Uh, I can give a brief overview. Okay. So I think it's important to say um, that this is a, satirical novel it's a satire um and it, it well I'm sure we'll get into this in more detail but um it's at times quite funny at times quite bizarre in my uh in my reading of it but basically um it's well okay so basically it's sort of autobiographical but I think ultimately fiction uh you know so basically it's about um a girl who's born to a Jewish father and a black mother. Um, none of the grandparents kind of support this relationship and her father and mother divorced before um, when she's young. Um, and so she grows up in Philadelphia with her mom's parents. Um, and then when she's a teen, she goes to New York to try to track down her dad. Um, and then it basically turns into kind of a like story of her in New York. And it um, talks a lot about kind of how society feels about race and ethnicity. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it, there's a lot to talk about. It's, it was a little um, confusing for me at times just to, um, you know, it does kind of delve into the like, like I said, kind of like bizarre. Um, but that's, I guess, the overview generally of of the overarching plot. I feel free to jump in if I missed or if there's anything else that someone feels like is super important to start off with. That sounds yeah. With Go how ahead. well you did with that, Elizabeth? Yeah, it was such that a Elizabeth. gnarly book to try to explain because. I, I got the feeling that uh, the author really enjoyed writing the book. I think that she took Oreo down the path that she wanted to write, uh, but that meant that sometimes it was in service of a joke rather than a plot. Uh, so you did just a beautiful job, Elizabeth, of tying ends together to 
give this a a, a through line. Um, yeah, I, I agree, and I think it does um, bear weight a little bit to say that it is based on roughly on the um, myth of Theseus. So, like that does help give it some structure. Um, I'll, you know, although it depends when you kind of piece that together in the book, I guess. Um, so on that note, how did you experience the book? Like, were you engaged immediately? Did it take you a while to get into it? Uh, were you amused, frustrated, uh, confused? How did you feel reading this book? I enjoyed reading this book. But perhaps by my tone, you can feel that there's a but. Um, this is the type of book where I would like to be taught the book. There are so many tidbits. There are so many words that I didn't know or um, references, references I wasn't familiar with. So I would have derived so, uh, I believe I would have derived so much more pleasure from this book if I had read it in a, almost like a school setting. Um, with that being said, it was funny. And if you just go to your, if you just say to yourself, well, I'm confused, but onward we go, then, you know, that was great too. But at times I did feel like I'm just, uh, there's certain things that I'm missing that would, uh, I would otherwise derive pleasure from if I was in the know. Yeah, I would agree with that. I read the first 50 pages probably three times. <laughs> like I read it, I listened to the audiobook, I read it again because I was just like, what is happening? <laughs> um, and I was talking to a friend of mine and I was like, I think I'm struggling with this book. And he was just like, oh, really? That's one of my favorite books. And I was like, really? And then I kind of just had to like let go and just get through it all. Um, because it was funny. It was just like bananas at the same time. Um, and I will admit, like, I did not catch any of the Theseus references, like, at all. Didn't realize that was happening at all. <laughs> Got to the, like, very end and I was like, oh, I kind of want to read it all again now. Like, go study up on Theseus and then do it all again. Um, which like it was an enjoyable book it was funny it was weird but yeah i did struggle a bit with it i can't imagine what reading this book via audiobook would be like you're like reading like a dinner menu but it's like an audiobook yeah you're like what the heck it was very confusing but then some of the jewish words that like i don't know hearing the pronunciation just kind of like had a very different flow, which I was grateful for, just to like know how it's supposed to sound instead of blank spots in my mental <laughs> voice. I did a similar thing, Marissa, where I started reading the book and I realized I'm reading this too fast in a way where I'm not letting it sit with me. And um, so I got the audiobook. But what I would do is when you got to those points that are clearly describing visual matter, I still had the book with me. So then I was like, I don't need to listen to someone read this menu. This is clearly a menu. This is something that I can read quickly. And so it would kind of jump between the two. Uh, I thought the narrator did a great job. And I agree that I, when I was reading it myself, I was looking up a lot of Yiddish words. And when I was listening to it, the context and the way that she said things um, really made... Um, made it easier to understand and concept. I still looked up a few things, but it just flowed a lot better. I, I will say though, it is definitely a, a, a book of its time and listening to it as an audiobook, my husband kept going like, wait a minute, you're listening to this for work? What is this that you're doing? Uh, because there are points in it that it, it's got very explicit language and content um, like comedy often does. Yeah, um, I, also felt like this book needed to be taught to me for me to fully enjoy. I felt like I got handed Joyce's Ulysses or something like, you know, I, I needed an annotated book to go along with this book, but I'm just gonna go ahead and play like my nerd card right now, which is my little dictionary that I always bring uh, to books like this. You know, I want to stop since I knew that this is a book that was sort of like, 
just as much about playing with language and 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 words um, than as it was about a plot, perhaps more so. Um, I had this with me and I just wrote down, and since this is my tiny baby dictionary, it didn't do me much good with this book. I had to break out like the notes section and just start writing like lordotic, septilegic, sigmoid, indehiscent, crepitation, blatted, nidor. I still don't know what any of those words mean. And those were in, I think I, I think those five words I, I wrote down within maybe two pages of this book. So that might give some people a sense of like what this book is about. And I patted myself in the back every time I caught one, like a reference, like, because it was so seldom that I did succeed in catching a reference. So, um, but that was kind of part of the fun, you know, like when, um, through some wordplay, uh, Oreo is, or is, is confronting a pimp and they're talking about that and, and they reference, um, cockles and muscles. And I was like, Oh, I know that one. I know that. One. <laughs> um, and, and I felt proud. Um, but, uh, I did not enjoy this book, uh, until page 50, until I kind of knew what I was getting into or right around that. I just kind of strapped myself in and it started getting maybe easier to read maybe for me personally around page 50 or so. Um, and I, I just started having fun and like dog earring pages and, and, and really getting into the book. I felt like, um, I kind of, this is like, I felt like I didn't have enough time to devote to a close reading of this book, which is really what it takes, which is what some of you were doing. Um, but you know, it's a busy time for us at the library right now. And I admit that like, I struggled to, I missed a lot of references for sure. Um, there were some parts that like, there were whole jokes that were like just lost on me. Um, and I did not, unfortunately, I think, and I actually learned a lesson from this to usually I try not to look up the books first because I like to like self interpret and then look up afterward and like see, but I think for this one, I did myself a disservice because I didn't get the myth thing. I also don't know that myth. So it wouldn't matter if I did like know that it was, you know, kind of following that. Um, so I was kind of like a little bummed because I think this, I think I could have gotten more out of, I, I like, if I'm, I'm talking to, you know, someone considering reading this, I think it's, it would be, it's a good book to close read. And it's a good book to really, um, like Emily was saying, do the audio and the, and have the physical copy in front of you too. Like all of that, I think would, it, it would enhance the experience. Whereas for me, I was just kind of like chuckling every so often, but also like lost much of the time in like exactly what was transpiring. So I, um, you know, I don't think, I think, but I blame that. I put that on myself, not necessarily the book, I guess is what I would say about that. I also, yeah, I, as, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was gonna say as long as, as much as it is like a literary book and sh like Fran Ross is obviously like so smart. <laughs> so smart um I also wish it was kind of like in a the context of just like what else was happening at the time because it's such a product of its time like so published in 1974 and like there were parts where I could like I feel like I could hear jokes in the voice of Richard Pryor or like Mel Brooks or like like it just felt like the 70s to me and so like I'm too young to get most of that like there was so much stuff that was happening that I was like I have no idea what this means. I'm maybe this is a reference to something in pop culture of the time, and I just don't know what that is. But if it was like framed more in a what was happening in 1974, maybe that would be helpful. But also, then knowing that the book was kind of a flop when it first came out also is interesting. So, like, maybe that wouldn't help. I, I don't know. <laughs> it would be very interesting to see if she had made it further along uh, because some of the jokes she makes are still so like, I, I'd like to think of it as timeless. Like I starting the book and the last epigraph is epigraphs never have anything to do with the book. And that made me laugh out loud. And I just like wanted to watch, 
you know, the TV show that she would get hired to write now with her absurd humor, um, but then through the lens of today, because like you said, Marissa, I don't, I, I wasn't alive in the 70s. And so everything I get is just what managed to seep through pop culture and who knows what kind of representation that is. You know, yeah, I think it's, um, it is interesting to think about when it was published and why it, it wasn't successful. Um, when it was published and just addressing what you just said, Emily, I think it's really interesting to look at stuff like the epigraph or her little charts throughout the book. Um, like when I was first reading, I think we're more used to seeing that now that happens a lot. People play around with different parts of their book. They will put in funny stuff, but in 1974, I can't um, imagine that that must have seemed really unusual to see those kind of to see all the different pieces coming together to make a book and not have it all just be words on a page. Um, and I wonder if that experimental element is part of why it didn't succeed. Um, I, because I was gonna, because I was facilitating this discussion, I did sort of reread parts of it and it was so different after I got to the end, it's like what you were saying, Marissa, and I, everything was explained to me exactly and then I could go back and be like oh yeah I totally see that and so that was really helpful and I'm wondering if it's a book that is not meant to be read just one time and um what's kind of cool about that is that like this is the only book she wrote so you know you could read it multiple times and it would probably be a different book I think each time um but um I, I was going to say also oh, about it being written in 1974. That's the same year that Roots came out. And Roots was huge. Um, and it, you know, I think Roots is a book that looks at like the, 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 the past for Black people and how they got there. And it was turned into this TV show that was like hugely successful. And this book comes out and it's kind of looking towards who knows where and it's got this murky kind of plot and there's definitely um you know there's like miscegenation it's not really examining just the black story so it, you know you wonder if it's lost in the shuffle there or it wasn't the right time for it um but it is interesting to think about the time in which it was written um so the, well, wait, Lucy, can I just yeah. comment on that really quick? Yeah. I just, I was thinking about that and like, I mean, I also just think that like Roots is not really a difficult story to follow, right? Like it's, you know, I mean, I mean, it's challenging in the sense of like reading about difficult experiences, but it's like quite straightforward. It's like linear in time and, you know, uh, like just a, it's just, you know, so it's, it's so different than Oreo. And like, I think if one was going to like choose to like, oh, like read about like the black experience at the time, it might have been quote unquote easier for people of all races to just like follow roots, you know, and like, this is much more challenging. So it's just, it's, it is kind of ahead of its time in that way. I think that it's, it's just, it's, um, it's a more difficult, like, like read in some ways, you know, anyway. Yeah. And I think it's ahead of its time. I mean, the character of Oreo also, I think is very unique and ahead of her time in that, like, she's this pretty powerful woman. She's physically like impossible to beat emotionally. She doesn't get um, really beaten down. You know, she's just, she's a pretty incredible character. And I, I, I'm, I don't know if there would have been a place for her, but um do you think you would have appreciated having the, like would the ending of the book come first? Uh, it might not have just, made a better story, but it would have mm -hmm. made me a better reader. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm tempted to, first of all, read the Theseus myth more than it just shared in the book and then maybe go back and skim. So I, I may hold on to my copy a little longer. This discussion is making me think, Oh gosh, I missed too much. Yeah. Um, I did watch a video on YouTube that explains the Theseus myth and I would really 
suggest doing that only because the myth is as complicating as, as you could imagine. Um, but I did, <laughs> it was a spoiler because at the end of the myth, the father jumps off a cliff and I was like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so yeah. Now I know what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So. Um, uh, I don't know. I really struggled with like, it didn't really feel like this story. I didn't read this story as like, a, a kind of back to what we were talking about or Elizabeth was getting out about roots. Like, that story, I haven't read it, but I, 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 I'm familiar with the, the broad strokes and, um, you know, it's straightforwardly difficult. Whereas, you know, like you, you can, you, you can comprehend the narrative. You follow the, the path. Um, there isn't really a path in, 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 in this story that is immediately legible. And I think that that sounds like a lot of us are struggling with that. I, I, I are struggled with that as we read. Um, and I, I guess, also, I, I did not feel as if it was uh, th that it was useful to think of this story as like, like any. It, it, what I mean but to say is it's kind of like cartoon like. Like there are a lot of situations in this story because of what Lucy was talking about. Because Oreo is this kind of um, incredible heroine. She's just so strong emotionally. She's just so strong with her like what was it way of the interstitial thrust like her martial yeah, arts witch. method yeah yeah like whatever like gets thrown at her she's gonna roll through it and in that way it's a cartoon it's not like um roots i would imagine uh or 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 books that maybe have that have more of like a grounded in reality type of a feel although uh, i'm sure that there, there there's a lot in in this book that I, that resonated with me that I laughed out loud because it felt like it was kind of um, observational humor type stuff um, like relationships um, or how how humans relate to one another, uh, I, I, both across races and also, um, you know, men and women uh, that that seemed to be a really big theme in here. Um, and, you know definitely seems like a product of its time. Some of it felt like some of the humor definitely felt like, whoa, yeah, this is putting me into kind of like a 1970s frame uh, you know, before my time, but I could kind of sense like this is, this is the way things are said or how um, kind of uh, cartoonified some of these, these, these issues were dealt with. It, it did feel like, uh, there's just so much going on. Um, and uh, some of it was really delightful. And some of it was like, I just, I, I'm, I'm perplexed. Um, so, yeah. I, so what I'm trying to say is it was, it's difficult for me to really like follow a plot here or even talk about this book in the frame of a plot. Cause like the plot doesn't, in my opinion, feel quite like the, the point. Um, that's my that's my take. And to in response to you being like it is like a cartoon, I had the thought that I was like each little section is almost like a meme, and like the main character of the memes is Oreo, and it's like Oreo does this thing, and it's like imagine Oreo doing this thing, and it's like can you imagine Oreo in this situation? And this, it, I was like, oh, it's, it's something modern that i can almost point to that it reminds me of is a meme mm -hmm. but it also reminded me of at least the format reminded me of um geez you know it's the 1970s it's a comedy show and they pop out of a wall all these people pop out of, of oh. a wall yeah you know what i'm talking about laughing? yeah i do laughing laughing I've seen this clip of like, they have like a wall, like wall of jokes and somebody yeah. pops their head out and is like, can you imagine if Oreo saw her own father jump out of a window, close the door. And then like somebody <laughs> else like, opens one and is, you know, tells another joke. Um, yeah. So in, in, and I think if you step away from what is the plot of this? Mm hmm which I even after watching the video about Theseus, I was like, oh, this means nothing in context to this book. <laughs> it really doesn't. Um, yeah. 
I don't know. I, I think I would have enjoyed the book more if I had taken a different viewpoint rather than looking at it from the viewpoint of like a book with a plot. Mm -hmm. Oh man, totally, totally. Uh, I want to say just two things to what you said, Jacob. Um, one is uh, you made me, with your reference to laughing, you, you reminded me of something I caught uh, on YouTube years ago, which is um, like a compilation of clips from a sketch comic artist named Lenny Schultz. And uh, I mean, he was very like madcap, like he would do just, just, just like silly things where he would like I don't know, like sing opera and like scarf noodles or like he would uh, and his line was like, go crazy, Lenny. And he would like do something, you know, silly. Um, and, and, but that, I showed that to friends because I thought it was hilarious. And some friends said, uh, this this is so old, like humor doesn't work like this anymore. Like this is so ooh, no. <laughs> and I, I like that. I like that kind of humor. <laughs> Just kind of I don't know. I feel like what you're putting down with the, like the laugh in there's like this sort of a similar vibe in maybe in this story too, where it's just like, I don't know. Yeah. Oreo here. She is sleeping in a park in New York. What could happen? Uh, she, she finds a kid who's like ripping tearing animals apart. She, she, she hires a bunch of kids. She pays them a nickel a piece to tear this kid and play tug of war with this kid's body. And then she tells him to stop. And the kid promises never to like harass animals again. I mean, like what is happening? Like, I don't know. I, I, I don't, if there's a deep allegory there, I missed it. What I did was I read that and I went like, wow, what the heck? is going to happen next with Oreo. I, I just, I don't know. That was the level at which I was enjoying this story. Um, and, and, and the other thing is it's useful. I think kind of interesting that you pointed out like the meme type framework and think about how maybe this book could mean, could like, could just be a s series of situations with Oreo in them and like what she's going to do this. So like when, uh, I think there's like one moment when she's confronting a pimp and like fighting him uh, and he manages to touch her hair. And that's like the moment where, I mean, everything else, like, of course there's like combat and she's like parrying him and like, it's not, and there's this other weird character with a huge penis who's coming to assault her and that doesn't work. And probably don't have time to get into that right here. But um, uh, just like the, just being like, no, that was the thing. That was the thing that really was the, the, the indignation was you touched my hair. No, you don't get to do that like that. <laughs> and it reminded me of that Solange song, like, don't touch my hair. And I don't know. I just like felt like, hey, we're still like kind of th these are things that these are ideas that um, are still being uh, looked at now, critiqued and and discussed. Um, and. And so, I don't know, I felt like some resonance into the time, into today, even though it felt like, okay, yeah, this is happening in the 1970s. This was written in the 1970s. It's clearly another era. There's, there's stuff in it for now. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no, like, group of people that she did not satirize Fran Ross in this book. I mean, there's no, she doesn't leave any group you know, um, unscathed. And I, so I think that like, I did find like you Lauren pieces of, of this satire that really did resonate today as well. That, um, and because there's so much of it <laughs> to pick and choose from. There's also, also a lot just like that felt refreshing to read, especially as like a woman reading a story of a woman going on this adventure. And like, I just kind of have been primed to expect the worst to happen to her of like she's sleeping in a park and that, she's yeah. fighting a pimp and I'm just like something awful is gonna happen <sighs> and then it's just like this silly goofy little thing where she you know beats him up and everything's fine and dandy and it's just like oh yeah like when was the last time I've ever read something like that like not not often <laughs> um and it just felt good in a way to read something that wasn't just terrible <laughs> so I will. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, sorry. One more thing that kind of your comment reminded me of Marissa is like, yeah, it, it felt kind of refreshing to hear like these serious themes done in a playful or bitingly satirical way, uh, kind of uh, expressed one that 
I'm just reminded of based on your comment was um, there's a, there's like a paragraph somewhere in this book where they're describing um, a, 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 a town um, where blue collar white workers can come and work and they're invited and they're okay. But any, any like lower class white is not allowed in this town because, you know, if you let the whites in to this town, like the, the town's going to go to pot, like clearly, like there's just going to be uh, like, uh, I, I don't know that that was, that was flipping obviously like a reality, which is that black Americans were uh, denied um, from so many communities, excluded, um, and, and and that felt like I don't know, just the way in which that was just kind of dropped in there. Like, hey, yeah, uh, I, it it there are lots of moments in this book like that, or there were for me where I kind of was like on my toes, like, oh, okay, yeah, um, that is a, that is a that is a reality that you flipped and you're playing with, um, yeah. Yeah. Did, um, did anyone have a favorite character in this book? I loved, um, the way that Oreo's grandmother talked and the way that they set it up that like, she just lives her, her own version of language. And sometimes we're going to have to give you a translation and sometimes you can figure it out. Um, but I also just found her, uh, and her like sense of this is just the way I see the world, uh, both funny and just like, yeah, I'd like, I'd like this lady to live next door to me. Uh, I, or maybe it's just because I love reading about food. So I also, and, and eating food and making food. So it was also <laughs> hearing all of the things that she created. Uh, I would have loved a little more of her, but of course, Oreo had to go on her journey. I felt the same way, Emily. I was a little bummed when um, that character kind of was not a part of the book or fairly early on um and uh, i would have liked yeah she she was kind of a hoot <laughs> i think yeah, Orgo's I her... my favorite oh go ahead oh. i was just saying to, to, to that note just quickly about the grandmother i loved that the page her menu the page where they print it out like i looked up every single thing on there that i didn't know what it was and just, that's like a world feast i mean she's cooking from all over the world so mm. um, Anyway, sorry, go ahead, Lauren. Oh, that's cool. Um, now, I was going to say, I think what uh, I loved Oreo, she was probably my favorite, but Milton, this like one of her tutors that he shows up, he's the milkman who shows up around like page 48, which is right around the time I think I was like dropping into the book and enjoying it, um, beginning to enjoy it. And uh, he just like, he's her un unofficial tutor. He's just got like, these observations about things that I, about life, which I thought was kind of funny, where he's just like, I can, I can picture him like just talking as he's like dropping the milk or whatever and like dropping knowledge as well. And um, he's, uh, he says stuff like, uh, you ever notice that all dentists have hairy arms and a large wristwatch? You ever notice that insurance men walk fast? Uh, you ever notice that you feel guilty sitting in a movie theater waiting for them to turn the lights out and start the picture? Like, yeah, okay. There's like maybe some truth in all that. <laughs> it's very funny. Um, so I enjoyed him. Honestly, I just loved Oreo, like, <laughs> especially like, I think if this had come out today, it would be like, oh, she's a Mary Sue, this is unrealistic, blah, 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 which like, of course is the point, but it's just so nice to have like, just this really brilliant, funny, charismatic person who can just beat up whoever she wants and be, get away with it and just be silly. And yeah, I just really enjoyed that as a main character. What's a Mary Sue? A Mary Sue is like a character who's like perfect, basically, like has no flaws and is just beautiful and perfect and everybody wants to be her, be with her. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think she was my favorite too, just because like you're saying, Marissa, to see, to see, to read a woman like that, like a, a black woman, especially, I think we get so many books where their, that story is, um, more about a, a struggle that's really like they can't get to the top of it and or or the oppressive factors that are they're facing and um just to see her like anything or any person who got in her way who challenged her mentally who challenged her physically she's just like yeah i, I got something for that that's you know 
um, and it was it was always unusual and um, her way of of navigating around obstacles and um, and her you know her special martial art um, I I really <laughs> enjoyed that so yeah she's uh she was my favorite character as well. And because every time we do get a character like that, then there's always some place or character in the book that like puts her in her place. And like the fact that we didn't have to deal with that was also just great. <laughs> and I just loved how she was unfazed. Like like someone was saying mm -hmm. earlier, like, you know, I, I, Marissa, I think it was you. Like, I felt the same way as you. I kept thinking, you know, waiting for the kind of the other shoe to drop, something bad to happen, an interaction to go like horribly wrong. And like, she just kind of like dealt with everything and like was just <laughs> on to the next quest, you know, which was really quite delightful in a way. Yeah, she's really fearless. And uh, I liked seeing that. And there's got to be a genre or there's got to be a word for like a character who has like an unorthodox life view and personality and like it is that personality that drives their story i don't know exactly what i'm trying to say i'm thinking about this movie i saw called happy go lucky where this woman is just like really happy and almost like annoyingly she's like a kindergarten teacher she's just like really excited and always makes the best out of the worst and the movie is just about like how she experiences the world from that viewpoint which for anyone would be unlivable, but for this character, it's what it's who they are. Got to be a word for that or something. But anyways, yeah, this discussion of Oreo as being like this, just kind of like completely powerful, un untouchable character um, who doesn't ever see any like real challenge that bests her. I don't know. It kind of. I was thinking about other books I've read for this series and, you know, there's not any other character that can quite touch that. It's not, there's nothing like that. I, I have, um, I did think that Janie, the character, the main character in their eyes were watching God is maybe the closest one that it comes to it, it just in terms of like, she is so strong. She's so, she, she is so emotionally like aware and powerful, but she, she is, she is tested. Um, and, and, and there are moments where she's really like down, you know, um, uh, but, uh, but I think a case can be made that, you know, she prevails and she is one of these like strong, um, female lead, um, type characters as well. Um, and then, I mean, I think like she doesn't quite have maybe the happy go lucky type thing going on, but she definitely sees, uh, she's just so clear eyed and goes through life, like being like, why wouldn't I try to take this opportunity? Why wouldn't I go on this adventure? And I do see a connection there between, you know, Janie and, and Oreo in that way too. It's just like, of course I will, of course I'll do this, this thing that is absurd that no one would ever want to do or be scared to. But I guess in this case, like with Oreo, um, with this book, it just feels like a little bit like, I don't really know, like, I think we might make the mistake of not taking it seriously or like taking the book seriously um, because it has that cartoonish element to it. Right. Um, and I guess maybe that's like a, 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 a danger with this book. It's like, you know, you don't, you just kind of let it all wash over you and that's that. Lauren, I want you to write that research paper. I want to read this comparison between Oreo and Janie because I did not put those together, but you're right. They've, they've both got their journey and the chapters can be broken down into singular vignettes. So, you know, if you're looking for a side job that doesn't pay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I would really need to put in a request for like the annotated Oreo though. Yeah. I need that in order to do my research. So if you can do that for me, Emily, I'm in. <laughs> Yeah, I felt, you know, when I think when you're reading Oreo, like I personally felt that I was in the, the presence of, of genius a little bit. Like I just was like mm -hmm. the person who wrote this book is so much smarter than I am. And I, I will, you know, um, to be able to put just the words together that she put together and to come up with the situations that she did. I just like think you could really appreciate um 
Fran Ross's genius, but I think for me that also made it kind of hard to keep up. And um, so I'm wondering if she was alive today and she came to this book discussion, and you could ask her any question, what would you ask her? <laughs> where did you get, where did, well, how many dictionaries did you swallow, <laughs> Fran Ross? Like, how did you do it? You were so erudite, you know. I get I um, I I get teased uh, by by certain folks in my life who know that I use words. I tend to misuse, uh, you know, whatever twenty five cent words instead when a ten cent word would do. Um, that's just I love language, you know. I love language, and I think I would want to know where did you where did Fran Ross get her love of of language because it's such 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 unclear display. I think I would be curious about her writing process for this. And because there are so many different styles of writing in the book, we've talked about this, um, you know, were they all just in her head or was like, you know, what made her choose to uh, describe a certain thing in a certain way and then a different scene and a different, you know, I just would be curious about, like, I want to see her like, map of this book if she had one or whatnot just because it was so complicated and it was so many different um ways of writing and describing and like conveying a scene or instance or menu or whatever we're talking about and um I would just be I would I want to I would try to I would be interested in her her like process for this I just I just I haven't read a or seen a book like this really before. And I would, I'm so curious how she got it out of her mind and onto the page. I'd be curious about her relationship with myth um, and whether she was drawn to the Theseus story and decided to take it, or if she had a story in her mind and then realized that it could parallel. Uh, and if she had others in mind, you know, there's something very exciting about a debut book. So often when I finish one, I want to talk to the author about like, okay, well, what's your next idea? How do you, how do you move from this? And is it going to be something in the same direction or are you doing something entirely different? Uh, so it's strange reading a deep debut and also knowing that this is it. I would want to ask her about her experience being a, a writer for television as a black woman in the seventies. But also I would just want to be, I would just be like, can you believe the weather today? And she'd be like, it's pernicious. And I'd be like, oh, like, I just want to banter really. Yeah, I guess I don't have a specific question. I just like Emily, I would, Every time I read, especially knowing it's her first novel, I always want more and I want to see like what else is cooking. And like, it's so sad that she died so young. Um, and then I'm also curious just to like, try to find, you know, what episodes of shows did she, you know, write on? And obviously those are a little different because they're like, they tend to be like group projects in a way. But um, yeah, I'm just curious how much of her voice comes through in some of that. Um, yeah. And like, what else could have been? <laughs> yeah, I would like to know um, what she was reading. Like, you know, who um, who influenced her, if anyone? Like, what what writers besides taking a myth? Um, you know, and maybe that was it. Maybe she was like, I want to take this myth and s subvert it, and you know, make it about a black woman and not this white man but I but I just wonder like what writers inspired her um and if she you know what she was reading at the time that she was writing this book uh I think that that would be interesting to know and then also I might want to read it just because you know there's nothing else from her um do you think you'll reread this book I think I'm going to re-skim it now that I have the context from this conversation, but I don't think I'm going to sit down with it like I did the first time, just because there's so much out there. A, a book has to really, really be something to get me to, to reread it. Yeah, I want to say I would reread it. Um, like knowing everything with Theseus, I would I would like to reread it, but I, and also knowing myself and my many stacks of books, I am unlikely to. <laughs> 
Yeah, this book reminds me also of um, what is it, Tree of Smoke that we discussed, or was that was that a, uh, some book that we discussed uh, that had tree in the title? Um, my memory is terrible. Echo uh, tree. Um, Echo tree. Oh, yeah, the, that's the, it. The stories. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, Jacob. It, it, it reminds Oreo reminds me of Echo Tree in that like there's so much going on and there's more to explore, but there is the barrier of kind of psyching yourself up for such a story. It's not an easy read. And um, and with I felt this way with Echo Tree too, where okay, maybe there are one or two stories that like I I could understand and follow quite clearly, but many eluded me and i think i would not return to this book without guidance <laughs> you know professional guy like a teacher or a discussion group maybe you know again a situation where it was like yeah we all want to read this for sure and we all want to read it and we know what we're getting into it's not going to be the kind of book where it's like oops i skipped and i couldn't read it, i couldn't finish. it's like you have to read it and you have to marinate in this and you probably have to do some research um possibly Yeah, I really think this is a good book club book, even because as adults, most of us don't have the chance to go find a teacher who's specifically (laughs) teaching about Oreo, but at least having friends to talk about it with, I think is super important. And I'm so glad that we've gotten to do this because I feel like I understand it better now. Yeah, I think sometimes even talking about books in these discussions makes me want to go back and and reread it. You know, before I took part in the in book discussions like all the staff book discussions we've done I think I would have said no I don't have time to reread books there's too many books out there but I have ended up rereading a lot of books either before the discussion it was a book I'd already read so I reread it or after I've gone back and I've realized for me like I I really um I really enjoy the a second read um or sometimes even like you know a third read and I never would have thought that about myself before these discussions I just feel like every time I can go into a book with more information about the book it's like I get a lot more out of it um so I think I probably will reread this um just because I'm not ready to let it go it's also part of it for me so um, that's cool yeah I think I would like to reread it like I actually would genuinely like to at a time when I feel like I can sit down and do what I would call like a close read. Um, Because as I mentioned earlier on, I feel like I didn't have the chance to do that this time, which really was to my own detriment because I don't think I got as much out of it as there is to get. So in my future where I imagine being less things being less wild, I would like to, I would like to sit down and and re-explore, especially after chatting with all you and hearing um, you know, just even in this discussion, there were things that came up that I kind of missed that I would like to go back and read parts about. Does anyone have anything else that they want to add? Um, I feel like we could talk a lot more about this book. We could dive into language specifically. We could dive into food. We could dive into some of the, the bigger themes, but I also feel like we couldn't do any of that in about five minutes. So um, does anyone have any other like, pressing things they want to say about this book or another book it reminded them of or anything at all? No? All right. Well, I think then that's a good stopping point. So um, thank you all so much for for reading this and joining in this discussion. Um, I know for me, it really made the book a lot, um, a lot more interesting, not more interesting, but, but a lot more, a lot more, more. So, um, yeah, thank you.